Hearers of God's word, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus, our crucified and risen Lord. Well, first of all, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers, but also happy Mother's Day to all of those women in our lives through whom God has blessed us and has nurtured us. Could be teachers at school or Sunday school teachers, coaches, an aunt. We thank God for all of those wonderful women that God has given to us who have blessed us and brought us to this moment in each and every single one of our lives. What I'd like for us to look at this morning is what does it mean for us to abide to live, to be, to dwell in God's word. That is a theme that runs heavily through today's gospel lesson. What does that look like? And then secondly, what does it mean to be protected in God's name? What does that look like? It is clear from Holy Scripture that we desperately, we constantly, we need to abide, to remain, to dwell in the blessing of God's Word, to rest in Jesus, the living Word, to abide, to stay in Him. This is central to our Christian faith. (coughs) Oh, sorry. Maybe you can turn it off and on right before I have to cough. (laughs) Oh, well, everyone's awake now. We went to visit our grandchildren in Minnesota this past week, and I don't know if it was a gift they gave to me or a gift someone gave me on the plane, but uh, thank you for understanding. In the gospel lesson from two weeks ago, we heard Jesus speak also these words about abiding in his word. From John chapter 15, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Abide, remain in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So, What does it look like to abide, to remain, to dwell in God's Word? It's a lot like the image we read in Psalm 1, today's psalm. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on God's teaching day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season with leaves that do not wither. When I think about what does it mean to live, to abide in God's Word, what comes to mind for me is not something that a pastor ever taught me or any seminary professor ever taught me. Instead, it's what my mother and my father taught me. And maybe that's appropriate this being Mother's Day. I don't know exactly when, but it was, I believe, very, very early on in the marriage of Leroy and Laverna Larson that they decided that they wanted to start every single day in the promise, in the blessing of God's presence and God's name. They wanted to start their new life together right every single day. They wanted to begin each day by claiming his promises, by claiming his presence in them and with them. And they did this with a simple Bible verse. Probably many of you know it. It's Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. Therefore, let us Rejoice and be glad in it. They didn't make a big religious deal out of it. 
Instead, probably when us kids came along, they made it into a game. So whoever was alert enough the first in the morning would say to the other, this is the day that the Lord has made, and the other one would respond, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, the way that played itself out once they had four kids is sometimes early in the morning we'd come running into their room, see if we could catch them still awake, and we'd shout, this is the day the Lord has made. And they would say, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Or sometimes it was more like me stumbling into the kitchen in the morning, not awake, and my mother saying, this is the day the Lord has made. And we're going, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Yes, very importantly, it was far more than just simply proclaiming this promise of God at the beginning of the day. We also shared family daily devotions every single evening before we went to bed. We'd gather together in the living room, and mom or dad would read from the scriptures. When we were little, it was probably one of those uh, Bible picture story books that we could relate a little bit better to. I still remember the images from, you know, ages three and four. Those things stick in your head, don't they? Yeah. And then we would pray for one another, and we would pray for family members and for friends. And I can remember going past my parents' bedroom in the morning and hearing them beginning the day, praying for each other, praying for the day ahead, and praying for us, their children, interceding on our behalf before our Heavenly Father, praying for us. Isn't this the way it's supposed to be? Isn't it? My parents, they weren't pastors. They were just a couple of Swedish Lutheran kids born and raised on the plains of northwest Iowa, living in the gift, the promise of their baptism, knowing who we are, and starting every single day claiming that gift and living it out where it counts in our daily lives, making it part of our lives as kids growing up. This is the day that the Lord has made, and therefore let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, does this mean that every day everything is going to go great? (laughs) Oh, no. Every single one of us know that far too well. But it is claiming God's promises and choosing, choosing to live in those promises. It is a daily decision, and sometimes it's a moment-by-moment decision as life flies in your face. Claiming and choosing knowing that it is God who has made this day. And therefore, no matter what it throws at us, expected and totally unexpected, we live in the promise, the gift of our baptism. We know who we are and we know to whom we belong and that he will never, never leave us or forsake us. Because our God, no matter what life throws at us, our God is always, always greater still. Therefore, we shall rejoice and we shall be glad in it. I remember the morning after my father died. I walked into the living room and there was my mother looking out the window. It was in that very room that just a few short hours before my father had passed. We were all around him at the time, his wife, his kids. All four of us had been able to come home. And we surrounded him and sang to him his his favorite hymns. And we read for him and for us those wonderful, 
wonderful promises from God's word, reminding us that it is our Lord Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, who has the last word for us, and it is always life and grace and the power of his forgiveness. And we were praying also those great ancient prayers, commending my Father into the hands of our loving Heavenly Father. It's a beautiful way to go home to Jesus. But death's still hard for us who are left behind. We know our loved one is with Jesus, and we thank God for that. And just imagining them set free from all sickness and disease fills our hearts with joy as we vision them in the joy of the heavenly kingdom, set free. And yet at the very same time, our hearts are heavy, and we know the loss. So there was my mother standing in the living room, looking out the window, and she turned and she said to me, This is the day the Lord has made. And I knew what I had to say in response. And I sucked it up. And I declared, and therefore we will rejoice. And we will be glad in it. Because despite our present sorrow, we knew the promise of joy and life and victory that my father already knew and we someday would share with him. We are God's Easter people. Oh, you, oh may you never, ever forget that. Especially now in this season of Easter, we need to remind ourselves of that again and again so it can live in our hearts and minds throughout the whole year why do you think there are seven Sundays in the season of Easter to drive that promise into the very depths of our being? We are God's Easter people, and therefore we are the children of his promise. We live in this promise, the promise of a life with God that nothing, not even death, can destroy. We live abiding in his word, Abiding, living in his promises, claiming his promise, claiming his presence in us and with us every single day of our lives. In today's gospel, Jesus prays to the Father this prayer for us. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me. I protected them in your name that you have given me. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So what does it mean to be protected in God's name? I guess I would pose that question a little bit differently. Have you ever been in a situation when you were under someone's protection? What comes to mind for me was a personal example from one of the trips when we took groups to the Holy Land. Our guide was a man named John Corey. He was the eldest male of his entire Palestinian family there in the old city of Jerusalem, Kori. The very name itself, it means priest, reminding him and everyone in the Kori family and in that community that they had come from a very, very long line of priests in the Christian Eastern Orthodox Church. John at that time was in his early 70s. Dark, dark-skinned Arab with a most gorgeous, snow-white flowing hair. He was magnificent, and he was fast. <laughs> Even the youngest of us could hardly keep up with him when he started to walk. 
We were about to go into the old city of Jerusalem, and he again reminded us about pickpockets. Watch where your things are stored. Be careful. Watch out for the little hands that might reach in. And then, even though we thought we were being so careful, so vigilant, it happened. A little hand slipped in, pulled out some cash, and the kid was gone. Boom, that fast. And the fellow in our group suddenly realized he'd been hit. And so he immediately told John, and John immediately began screaming, not yelling, screaming in the most angry Arabic at every single open window, every single open door in those narrow streets of the old city of Jerusalem. He was screaming, you know who I am. You know who I am. And you know, you do not touch my people. You find who stole that, and you bring it back to the motel tonight. And the money, all of it, came back to the motel that night. Yeah. We were under the protection of the name John Cory. And if it can have that much clout and that much power in the city streets of old Jerusalem, just begin to think about the all powerful name of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It was in our baptism. That's where God took your name and joined it to his all-powerful, all-holy name, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It was in that moment that the Heavenly Father made you a child of the Heavenly Father. A child of the Heavenly Father. You are children of the king. That is your birthright in the waters of baptism. That is when you became one in Christ, a Christian. Get it? Yeah. One in Christ. Christ in you and you in him, abiding in him and he in you. So what does it mean to be under God's protection? Obviously, to be under God's protection, under the protection of God's name, (laughs) it does not mean a trouble-free life. Indeed, 11 of the 12 apostles all died as martyrs. Now, that's just a little bit of trouble. The world is messy. It's broken. As we look at the news, I'm beginning to think it's looking more broken every single day. Evil is increasingly becoming more and more blatant and evident. And Jesus said, Holy Father, protect them. Protect them in your name. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. In the midst of this broken, messed up world in which God sends us, no matter what assails us, we have the promise that no matter whether it's the evils of sickness or disease or death itself or the devil himself, none of these will have the last word for you or for me, but it is the word of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, and it is the promise of his victory, his resurrection, his life eternal. I don't know, maybe you have a favorite Christian song or hymn. In our family, we have chosen a family hymn. Or probably more accurately, I should say, I think that hymn chose us. We sing it at every family baptism where God claims us 
with his all-powerful name and makes us his own. And we sing it at every family funeral where we celebrate the completion of our baptism, our heavenly homecoming, God's great victory for us. For us, it's the hymn, Children of the Heavenly Father. When my mother was 11 years old, her mother died. It was the year 1933. It was something as simple as pneumonia. But back then, you see, there were no antibiotics. And very few people at that point had even been able to get a hold of sulfa drugs. My grandfather, husband of my grandmother, he was the town doctor and pharmacist. But no matter what he knew and no matter what he could do, he couldn't save his wife. The night that she died, as she lay in her bed, she began singing the hymn, Children of the Heavenly Father. Children of the Heavenly Father, safely in his bosom gather, Nestling bird, nor star in heaven, ne'er refuge such as given. Neither life nor death shall ever from the Lord his children sever. His the loving purpose solely to preserve them pure and holy. She kept singing that last verse over and over again the night she died. At the time, they thought maybe it was the fever. And then afterwards, they realized it was their mother. And she knew this would be her last chance to speak that wonderful word of promise into the lives of her children and her husband. Though he giveth or he taketh, God his children ne'er forsaketh. His the loving purpose solely to preserve them pure and holy. Today know that you are God's Easter people. Abide in him and he in you. Live in the promise Live in the glorious promise, the gift of your baptism, the gift of grace, and the joy of your salvation. This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made, and therefore we shall rejoice, and we shall be glad in it. Amen.